All right. Uh, should I close the door? Yes, uh, are you? Okay. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Maciej. I work in Berlin in Wire. We do a secure end-to-end -end encrypted messenger, but. Um, my today talk will not be completely about it. It will be about something I'm like a bit obsessed recently, and I want to share it with you. It's called Cellular Automata, and it's like a way to simulate the world. Um, but also today we will talk about, how, of course, how it will was created, like where can we use it in some real life situations. The main thing will be about the examples of how can we generate some colorful pictures with it, because that's also possible. But I also have some kind of a hidden agenda. I have this theory that we work too much, uh, we have not enough fun, and of course I can't say that I want you all to have fun during your work because work is boring. But maybe uh, we can remind ourselves how it was uh, when we started programming and how uh, inspirational that was. And now after years of coding, we just, uh, this is just like an our job. So, but that's, that will come later. Um, yeah, so there will be some examples here. And, uh, and happy Hall Halloween, everyone. Um, so what are cellular automata? Um, like, risking some oversimplification, a cellular automaton is a way to uh, model complex behaviors uh, by uh, making it into simple blocks of uh, simple data and some simple rules, and then uh, applying the rules all over again. To do that, we need just five things. We need a cell, some kind of data structure, and in Scala that would be just a case class. Um, we need uh, some kind of a board. It, it will be both a collection of uh, the cells, but also like a structure telling us how the cells uh, rely uh, like to each other in space. And that will be a map of positions to the cells. Um, then we need this concept of neighborhood. In a cellular automaton, a cell only uh, interacts with the local neighborhood of it. So there are two, ma two like, uh, main uh, things, main versions of neighborhood when we talk about uh, a two-dimensional board. It's von Neumann's, which means that the cell will only talk to the cells up, down, left and right. And Moore's neighborhood, which is like all eight cells around this one. But it doesn't mean that we can't define our own boards and our own neighborhoods. For example, the hexagonal board is quite popular as well. But that's something custom, like not classical. And the neighborhood in Scala, it will be a function from a cell to a map of the um, cells around it and their relative positions. So we also need rules. And the rule is, of course, a function, a function from the cell to like next iteration of the cell, uh, because we the cell is an immutable set of data, so we create a copy and update some of the fields or not. We can also just reuse the same cell if the rule say that well, nothing will change at all. And the last thing we need is some kind of a loop. We will. We need something that will take the board, will update all the cells, will create a new board, and will do it all over and over again. That's basically an iterator in Scala. But okay, well, this, this is a lecture. I will uh, have to tell something about the history. So the guy who invented the idea was uh, John von Neumann. He, somewhere in the middle of 20th century, inv invented quite a lot of computer science, actually. Um, and his first idea was not really that simple. It wasn't a board with some colored cells. It was more like a, a factory of robots swimming in a pool of resources and using those resources to build themselves like their own copies. And uh, clearly it was inspired by uh, mm, some chemistry and bio biology work with microbes in petri dishes multiplying and fighting for resources. Um, it was a bit too abstract for mathematics, so John von Neumann decided that he will try to do something more abstract exactly with the uh, 
um, with the block of, of bl black and white felt, and then he died. And only after some time later, another guy, Stefan Wolfram, you may know him from the Wolfram Institute, um, uh, came up, like took that work and start to do something about it, like create the rules, uh, some naming conventions. He uh, proved that uh, a cellular automaton can be used if Turing complete, so it can be used in theory to create a computer that will run cellular automatons, which will be used to create computers to run cellular automatons. And uh, he worked, because that's, that was like this computer science mathematical area, he worked with uh, one-dimensional cellular automatons. That means that uh, we have only like one dimension of space left and, and the cell has only two neighbors, left and right. And the vertical dimension, as we see it, is uh, usually time. So you can quite often see an article about cellular automatons and then some kind of a picture with a triangle. And you, you say, what? This is not a cellular automaton. Game of life is cellular automaton. Well, no, this is because like this triangle is how the automaton involve, uh, evolves in time. Um, yeah, and this is, for example, rule 30, which says that if we have the black cells uh, to the left and right, or, or white cell somewhere, then the in the next iteration, the central cell will change like that, and it, it unfolds like that. Um, right, I think it's, yeah, okay. Um, Okay, so what are we use? What 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 is the use of that? That's at all. So Stefan Wolfram also noted that it is possible to uh, for this um, automaton to behave in a chaotic way. In a we can simulate a very complex behavior, and that can be, for example, for weather forecast. Uh, every time you check if there will be rain in Lyon tomorrow, there will be, uh, then uh, you probably rely on something that works that, mm, in a way that at some level at least uh, works like a cellular automaton. We don't want to uh, have like a super big uh, equation of how the mm, weather processes work on the whole planet. Instead, we divide our planet into small blocks, and in each block we have just a few simple data we have weather uh, we have temperature we have humidity sun exposure air pressure a few other things like that and because it's so small it's quite easy to develop some rules like how it changes how it interacts with other blocks around it because weather is not uh, not magic it's simply weather patterns are simply these blocks of code uh, this block of data like interacting over the whole planet over time so this is how we can predict what's happening to the uh, to the weather in in a way that we don't really know how it works on the whole planet, but we know exactly how it works on small blocks. Uh, we can use the same approach to model physical laws, for example, gases and fluid dynamics, which is kind of strangely complex, to be honest. Uh, we can also use um, use it for simulations, like uh, everything that involves some kind of ecosystems or economy or uh, like how to build roads. In to prevent traffic jams. We can, of course, model microbiomes. It's called artificial life. And this way we can simulate and study how microbes uh, fight for resources. And we can use it for low-level artificial intelligence. And hold that thought. I will talk about it later for a moment. And also because of the chaotic nature of solar automata, we can um, actually generate data with it. And this is what we will talk about now. So, of course, uh, the most popular cellular automaton is Game of Life, invented by John Conway, who is a professor somewhere in Princeton, I think. And he invented it in the 70s, and I don't think there's uh, even one talk about cellular automata which uh, can avoid Game of Life. Um, okay, so the idea is simple. We have this cell, which is either alive or dead, we have a two-dimensional board. We have this more neighborhood, so there is um, like an all eight cells about the central one is taken into account when we calculate the next step uh, of the central cell. And the rules are like that, that if the cell is dead and it has three live neighbors, then the next iteration of the cell will be live. 
will be alive. If the file is alive and has two or three neighbors, then it will be alive again, like it will stay alive. Otherwise, if there is not enough cells in the neighborhood, or if there is too many cells in the neighborhood, the cell will be dead, either because of the it's overcrowded or because of loneliness. Like loneliness is a terrible thing. Okay, and this is a place for, for the first example. <coughs> so this is exactly that. We can simply put some data on it because like a white screen is like a stable state. If I leave it like this, then it will never not nothing will ever happen. But let's let's write something and let's run it like this. Uh, you can you can already see that there's this chaotic state, but also there's some kind of a it tries to get more uh, regular, more periodic, only it has problems with this because chaotic parts of the whole system are going to disrupt that. Oh, are already almost done. I think we can call it our first piece of life, uh, piece of art here. And uh, let's just game of life one PNG. This will be it. And and yeah, uh, how to implement it in Scala? We start with a case class. Simply, we have this game of life case class, which is which has just like one life boolean, and we have a board with the find cell method because the the every cell has to be able to somehow find other cells on the board, its neighborhood. So how to do it? We have to somehow connect the board with the cell. And the naive solution would be to give the every cell just a reference to the board. But that actually creates a problem, because when we create a board, that means that we need to populate it with cells, which need to know about the board, which we are just creating. So it's like a egg and chicken. So, um, the compiler won't let us do it, believe me, I tried. And um, the another solution to it is to give every cell just its own position, information about the position on the board, and give it a function which will, um, which when asked, it will tell you that, okay, at this point on the board, the cell, uh, there is the cell. So this is lazy. At upstart, at the mom in the moment of creation, the cell does not have to know anything about the board, only when it's, it has to ask about it. So then we implemented the rules as this update method. It's basically the same here as here. The only difference being that, okay, this is some kind of a utility function that will return the more neighborhood. Uh, this will count the number of the live living cells, and this is how we check what we do in the next iteration. And the, the difference is that also that if the cell will not be changed, then we return a none. So here in the, in the board, which has the next method, uh, in case nothing is changed, then we will reuse the old cell. And um, let's talk about the board for a moment, because that's something like I said before that the board is a map from positions to cells, but actually we need some kind of a um, way to translate the position to the ID, which, mm, which doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. Um, that's because when you look at the board like this, then on the edges, strange things happen. Usually when we are somewhere in the middle, we have this eight neighbors around, but on the edge, we have only five neighbors, and in the corners, we have only three. So that's literally a corner case here. We would have to have some ways to deal with it, like some additional rules that are uh, that will tell me, OK, this is a corner cell, so maybe we need only two alive cells, no three or something like that. That's not good. We, I would like to use something else. Uh, well, let's talk again about that model of a planet. So this way, if we have a board which we wrap around on a planet, or a ball or any kind, if we go to the leftmost cell and we go even more to the left, then we will come back from the right and the other way as well. So we at least we're done with this edge cases. We still have problems with the poles. Well, all, there are always problems with poles here. And, but we can do it again. We can like, if we wrap, we can wrap the 
board over the like div on the planet, and we can also wrap it around like from inside out, and we can create the the shape which um, is called a torus in mathematics. I prefer like a this is a donut, right? Um, so then, um, if this is like this, then we can go around it, but we can also go to the up and then come back from the from down and vice versa. If you ever played Civilization, I think in Civilization 4 we you were able to have your civilization on a planet which was a donut. That was awesome. Um, so um, now, so we are done with all the edge cases. We can uh, simply don't have them at all. Another thing is that we, when we create a board and we update it and we create another board. And we use this new, for in a moment we'll use this new board as a, the old board to create even newer board. So this is actually like a sequence of boards over time. And in Scala, well, that will be an iterator. We can implement it now. Uh, and this iterator will be, will need the size of the board. The dim is like the length of the edge. We'll have like always square boards, no matter what for the simplicity, and, but it also needs two functions. You it need to know, needs to know how to create a cell, so this is the cell apply method, and it also needs to know how to compose those cells into a board. And because we will use that donut there, then it means that it will always be some kind of, we have this default board apply method. Okay, and this is probably the most magical line in all my product, and this is because to create an initial board, we um, we use this apply of the board method, and for that method, we need to uh, well function. We need to give it a function that will create the cells. But for that apply cell method, we need to, uh, as one of the arguments, we need to give a function of the board which will be then used by the cell to find other cells. So this is like this. But this is all. Like, the, don't don't be scared. The, all the rest of the uh, of the whole uh, iterator is really easy. The next method simply calls next on the board, and voila, we can have an automaton like this, and we can use it simply to like iterate over time, over like one million uh, times, or we can apply some I don't know final condition. Okay, another uh, of our examples will be Langton's ant. This is. Uh, important because, well, in a minute. Langton Fund was uh, created by Christopher Langton in 86. And by the way, the fact that the photo is black and white doesn't mean that if he's dead, he's, I think, pretty much alive, but this is simply a Wikipedia photo. And there, are, it's more complicated. Just like um, in case of a uh, um, of uh, the game of life, it, uh, the game of life was like a simulation of microbes replicating. In case of Lacknon's ants, we well, simulate an ant. Uh, we have a cell which uh, can be also black or white, and we have this another. Uh, we have a direction of the ant. It's we need to know which way the ant is headed or if if it's there at all. So we use the two-dimensional board at, uh, again. We use the von Neumann's neighborhood this time. And the rules are like that. It's a bit more complicated because we have two, uh, two things and one. So we get this. We check if there is a... Um, an ant in our neighborhood, and if this ant is coming to to us, like to, if this is headed into our direction, if yes, then we take the ant and turn it to the right or left. It depends on the color. If the field is, if the cell is white, then the uh, ant will be uh, turned right, and if the cell is black, then the Ant will be turned left. If there is no ant at all, or if there is ant but it's not going in our, like you can have an ant here and but it's going like to the other place, then the uh, then the field uh, the option of the direction here will become none. And for the color, if the uh, our ant is uh, going through our cell, then the color of the uh, cell will be flipped. Otherwise, it will stay the same. Yep, the second example. So we will start with just a single ant here, and this is like a just like a one 
piece of data, and it is enough to like disrupt the stable state. It will just go like this all the time, creating some pattern. Just generally, it, it turns right until it finds itself like its own thread, and then it turns left and then right again. But you can quickly see that this is quite of a like a chaotic pattern. It will become more regular in a moment, but well, this moment will take a few minutes, so I will just leave it in the background for this time, and I will come back to the video. And um, okay, so we have now two automatons, and we can think about what's common to them and what can we uh, abstract away, like. So, so this way we will learn how much of the code is actually just for that, for that given automaton, how much of it is common, and it's really like 90% a, a of the code is the same in both cases. So first of all, we have this position and find cell fun function, which is the same, and we have this declaration of the update method, which is the same, but this time it's for length and sound. So we can create a trait. And here's the lit little trick. The trait has this lower bound here, and the lower bound is the cell itself. So when we call find cell method, it will uh, return the exact cell, not the trait. And we need that exact cell because we want to un uh, access the state here, and the state is not in the trait. And yeah, so now we can just write that the Langton and extends the trait, the position find cell and the update is overwriting that, uh, the ones from the trait, and we have to uh, rewrite the board and the automaton so it can work with the, all the case classes which uh, fulfill those conditions. So actually any automaton which is uh, which can uh, do it. Oh, by the way, this is the first type, uh, time in all my uh, career as a Scala programmer where parallel map actually made sense, because um, uh, on the cellular automaton, every cell is uh, parallel to each other. They don't interrupt each other. So using paramap instead of map actually g gave me a huge performance boost. All right, so, and this is what we were left with. We have to implement the state and we have to implement the rules with the update method. That's it. Okay, mm, ah, yeah. C let's come back. Okay, so our ant in the meantime created this chaotic part and then it started to do something like re this repeated pattern going around, going, going around, then it moved on the donut, on the surface, it came from the other end, and it hit the chaotic part. So it it started to work on this, but like as we see, it starts to create again the chaotic pattern. If we have like an infinite board instead of something that is wrapped around, uh, it would just go on this highway forever. Um, okay, so this is like the second. We can call it now. Um, Langtons and two PNG. Okay, but this is quite boring. It's still white and black. We have only one and like nothing's happening really. So the other, the next uh, example will be just a little development over this. It, so we will have this small uh, additional case class that with the color model. We will have the Langton's colors, which is like the instead of just one color and one direction, is a set of colors and a list of possible directions and colors of that of ants going in that direction. So we are able to put more ants on the well we were able to put more ants even before but they were all black and this type this time we can put colorful ants on the um, on the board like here yellow magenta and uh, cyan and when they even in when they co go from like through the uh, the same field, their colors will mix. They will not interfere with, it, with each other. They will go their own way. They will turn and go forward, but uh, the, they will leave the colors behind, and the colors will be uh, will be mixed on the on our board. So yeah. So one more example now. <coughs> So we can put like a few of them here. Oh, 
of a small bug that doesn't show them up start, but it doesn't mean much. So you can see two yellow, uh, magenta and cyan. We can now put some additional ants close to each other, so they will go to the same cells, right, like this. Yeah, you can see that this creates blue color on some parts, so yeah, now and yellow as well, so there will be some, some green and some black in the places where they all like come together to one cell. And, oh, I can see them, so, okay. Let's, let's have it, and it, it can also run in the background. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I want to talk to you about how the cellular automata um, works with uh, artificial intelligence. There will be one more example in a moment, but first, um, something else. Let's come back, let's say we have uh, this huge data set that, is, uh, that describes something that is happening over time. We can um, slice it, we can make like a subset of it that describes something in some moment in the past, and we can uh, take another part of it, another subset that is uh, describing something in the present or rather like a more recent past. And we know that the, because we have all the data, we know that the past is mm, what happened, or then something evolved into the present. So we want artificial intelligence that will learn how it happened, how the past evolved into the present. And we assume that if it does this, then when we give it the present subset, it will be able to predict the future. Because like the, if it learns all the rules and we ha have all the data, it can probably do that. So we have this artificial intelligence. We feed it the same um, the subset for the past. Then we simulate it. We get some prediction about this present moment, which we already we have the data about it. So we can then um, compare how the, our data about the present uh, is uh, different from the prediction. And we can use the, those differences to tweak the, um, the artificial intelligence. We have some feedback, we can then teach it better and uh, get, another, uh, get another round with hopefully better prediction. So if we how do we do it? If we use some kind of a neural network, then that probably um, will be some kind of backpropagation. We will just, it's pretty much automatic. In case of cellular automata, that's not possible. If the cellular automaton will be complex, it, if it will be something like uh, the sweater model, then quite, I'm quite sure that there will be many coefficients you will use, like this will say how much of that will transform into how much of this. And we can tweak those coefficients um, automatically with some uh, probability methods from Monte Carlo or maybe even some genetic algorithms. But quite often uh, it will mean also that we need to change the actual rules of the uh, automaton and for that we need actual humans which will, who will sit down and think about it. Um, for, well, there are some advantages to this, and the advantages is are that in case of ca uh, cellular automaton, we don't uh, talk about some very abstract complex mathematics. We talk about only simple rules, uh, working locally and in small amount of time. So they are easier to grasp intuitively. They are easier, easier to talk to because we talk about space and time, so something we just know about. The maths is simpler. We can actually communicate using our terms, like in everyday uh, use. So maybe we can actually uh, use that. Okay, let's go back for a moment. Oh, wow. All right. Um, yeah. So in case we have m we had many ants, you can see here we have a bit of this periodic, this regular pattern, but only for a moment, and then it all went crazy. And let's save it again. So this is Langton's, okay, but Langton's uh, colors free PNG. Cool. <coughs> um, yep. Yeah, please ignore the acaros. Um, but this is not all. 
my idea is that Felula, uh, the automata can be much more useful if we talk about some low level artificial intelligence like computer games or uh, some small embedded systems because exactly it's simpler. It doesn't require a lot of computer power to run a cellular automaton. Uh, imagine, for example, a, a shooter game where we have the player entering an area, and the area in the area there are a few enemies, these non-playable characters, and usually uh, we would have some AI units attached to those characters as if the, they were the, their brains, and every uh, enemy would ha then have to think for itself how to attack the player. But we can do it differently. We can um, consider the whole area of one automaton. And when there's no player, uh, then the automaton is in some kind of a stable state. So the NPCs here do nothing or just move uh, on some in some simple ways. But when the player comes in, that's additional data that disrupts that uh, stable state. So what happens? The automaton is uh, getting into this chaotic phase. It applies the rules. It uh, makes some decisions. We can. Um, like uh, interpret what it's doing as decisions and it wants to get back to the stable state and to do it it probably wants to kill the player uh, like when when the player is, is dead and we're again happy and we can stay and do nothing uh, so we can actually instead of having like a every element every npc on the board um, as a different object we can think about the whole area as one automaton performing some together some computations and as a bonus the teamwork of those npcs is then very simple to implement which is usually really a problem if uh, we work in this uh, computer ai and we try to communicate between NP npcs so okay uh, that's okay we have i have one more um example for you this is i call it a trace it's ag again we have this um state which is uh, completely stable we can disrupt it we can put some let's say that these are the npcs these colorful dots and the black dot is the place of the player and what happens when i run this uh, the simulation is that all the yeah every everyone wants to simply grab the player and come back to the simple state uh, to the end but okay we can the player can run away it doesn't have to be like this we can add some more and again this is like maybe 20 lines of code because all the rest is the same as in every other other cellular automaton. Here, go here, great. And um, that will be trace for PNG. All right. Ah, okay, here. Yep. Um, so all those examples, all the engine is there on GitHub. I tried to uh, document it the best way I can. There are some, if you're interested in that, uh, there are some like first issues you can try. Um, there I have also another, uh, another project, a small game um, artificial intelligence library. I write it in Rust, and this is actually this project is my, um, well, my that from there there uh, came the idea for this talk. And um, because I'm only learning Rust, you can find there a lot of design notes and uh, some bad Rust code. I hope it will be better. Um, for uh, uh, for the materials, I used uh, the book Cellular Automata Discrete Universe by Andrew Ulachinski. Uh, you can always find me on Twitter or on Wire. If you have any questions, please do, please reach out. And um, yeah, but my main idea here, like what I want to, wanted you to, to know is that maybe, well, this is not for you. I, I love it right now, but maybe this is not something that you're interested in. The, but I would like you to think about when you when you go out, what's what's what you, you what you're passionate about in programming. Like, what can be something that really uh, you think that 
you could do something more than just your usual day of work. So, yep, that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Um, do we have a... For the chase, does do, do the NPC have? Um, they only know their contextual um, information around their place, or they know all the information in the world? Uh, actually, that's a good idea because there are no uh, NPCs. There are only cells. Uh, okay, I will not. Maybe uh, I can show you the uh, the code later. Uh, there are only like uh, um, information about where is the player, and every cell has this, uh, access to this information, and then in it checks the neighborhood, and if there is a color in the neighborhood, and it, the, the direction from the color to the cell is the same as the, the direction to the player, then, okay, I will take this color. So there's really no model, there's no class in the code that tells you that this is an NPC. It's only like the tiles of the board uh, change from one to another. Thank you. Um, why, why Scala? Is it just for fun? Or b because there is obviously other languages where we have uh, much of this Im already implemented. Oh. Uh, I think Scala is awesome for abstracting away things. It's it has really like a, a lot of ways. In the in one way, it's something that I'm thinking, like the language I'm I'm thinking in when I'm programming. So it's easy for me. And the other is that uh, it it is able. I'm able to do like 90% of code uh, put together like this common part, and only some 10% uh, of the actual implementation of that automaton. So yes, that's that was really great to uh, when I came to this point where I compared the game of life to Langton Sand and then all right it's almost exactly the same if only I use the lower trait okay <laughs> all right okay thank you hi uh, thank you for the talk uh, I have two questions uh, I believe you did just for fun or do you use any of these in wire no, I don't use any of this in the wire, but I learned Rust. And I thought at some point I decided that um, writing all this in Rust from scratch would be too hard because there are too many different concepts. So Rust is similar on many levels with Scala, but not all, and I just run up in, run into traps all the time. So I thought, okay, I can, uh, I f I can write it in Scala. This is more natural for me. And then I can think, how do, can I translate it back to Rust? We use Rust in wire, so it might be actually practical also for me from that point of view. But this is mainly like my hobby project, only a bit bigger hobby project. Yeah. Great. Uh, second question is, uh, you you show how to solve uh, Conway's game of life you, like by extending iterator. Uh, uh -huh. Have you considered using a uh, co monad for that? You know, like you have a, a focus and you can just shift to the left or to the right. That's a great abstraction for it. Yeah, I read about different implementations, but I wanted for this talk, I wanted to do it from scratch. And in in simple enough way that I will be able to explain everything. Okay, thanks. Another question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you made it evident you're saving every image uh -huh. of your games. Uh, is there any one of interest you want to show us? Maybe your favorite or my favorite automaton. Mm. Uh, well, Game of Life is interesting, even if it's so simple. It took like 18 lines of code to do it, and uh, I know at least that there's a way to. Uh, someone did it in a way that. Uh, uh, th the cellular, the, the game of life creates um, like other uh, works as, uh, as a one cell that uh, um, changes the situation in, in the cell abruptly. I don't know if I can explain it 
properly. Like you have uh, a cellular automaton, which is composed of cellular automatons in Game of Life. So that was pretty pretty nice, but I don't have it here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.